There are times when an ancient text seems to speak more directly to where we are now than to the time when it was first written. Rarely has that been truer than in the case of the famous first comment of Rashi to the Torah, to the words, in the beginning God created. Let's listen to that comment in its entirety. Rabbi Isaac said the Torah should have begun with the verse, this month shall be to you the first of months, which was the first command given to Israel. Why then did it begin with in the beginning? It began thus because it wished to convey the idea contained in the verse, the power of his acts he told to his people in order to give them the estate of the nations, so that if the nations of the world would say to Israel, you're robbers because you took by force the land of the seven nations, Israel might reply to them, the whole earth belongs to the Holy One, blessed be he. He created it and gave it to them, and by his will he took it from them and gave it to us. Rashi might have been speaking directly to us in 5771-2010 in an age of anti-Zionism, boycott sanctions, divestments against Israel, and a growing question of the right of the state of Israel to exist. Now, Rashi lived in Troyes in northern France in the 11th century at a time when the position of Jews under Christian rule was beginning seriously to worsen. He lived through some of the more traumatic events of that period, the massacre of Jewish communities in the Lorraine at the beginning of the First Crusade in 1096, for example. Jews in his day were persecuted and powerless. They had no realistic hope of imminent return to the land. And as to the logic of Rabbi Isaac's interpretation, it seems strained. Why did the Torah begin with creation? Because that's a fundamental of Jewish faith. Rabbi Isaac seems to be arguing that the, since the Torah is primarily a book of commandments, it should begin with the first command, at least the first given to the Israelites, as a collective entity. But clearly, not everything in the Bible is a command. Much of it is narrative. So Rabbi Isaac's question is odd. And so, too, is his answer. Why relate creation to a challenge to the Israelites' right to the land? Why, if Rabbi Isaac's interest is solely in commandments, not give the obvious halachic answer? The story of creation is there to explain the command to keep Shabbat. That's the obvious connection. It's all highly perplexing. In fact, however, Rabbi Isaac is making a very cogent point indeed. Some years ago, a secular Bible scholar, David Kleins, wrote a book entitled The Theme of the Pentateuch. And his conclusion was that the single overarching theme of the five books of Moses is the promise of the land. That's surely the case. There are sub-themes, but this one dominates all others. Seven times in Bereshit, God promises the land to Abraham, once to Isaac, three times to Jacob. And the rest of the Mosaic books from the beginning of Exodus, when Moses is about the land flowing with milk and honey, to the end of Deuteronomy, when Moses sees the land from afar, the Torah's narrative is all about Israel, the destination of the Jewish journey. And there is a fundamental rule of literary form. Chekhov once said, if there's a gun on stage in the first act of a play, it has to be part of the plot or it shouldn't be there at all. So if the central theme of the Mosaic books is the promise of the land, the beginning must be in some way related to it. Hence Rabbi Isaac's point, the creation narrative must have to do with the central theme, the promise of the land of Israel. And what could this be if not to signal that the promise, in virtue of which the Jewish people holds title to the land, comes from the highest conceivable source, the sovereign of the universe, the creator and author of all. No sooner have we said this than an obvious question arises. Why should a religion be tied to a land? It sounds absurd, especially in the context of monotheism. Surely the God of everywhere can be served anywhere. But here, too, Rabbi Isaac steers us in the right direction. He reminds us of the first command of the Israelite, given to the Israelites as a people as they were about to leave Egypt. Judaism is not primarily about personal salvation, the relationship between an individual and God. 
It's about collective redemption, about what it is to create a society that would become the opposite of Egypt, where the strong enslave the weak. The Torah is the architectonic of a society in which my freedom is not purchased at the cost of yours, where justice rules, and each individual is recognized as bearing the image of God. It's about the truths Thomas Jefferson called self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. It's about what John F. Kennedy meant when he spoke about the belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We are social animals. Therefore, we must find God in society. And that's what we discover when we reflect on the basic structure of the Torah's many commands. They include laws about the administration of justice, the conduct of war, the ownership of land, employer-employee relationships, the welfare of the poor, the periodic cancellation of debts. In short, an entire legislative structure for the creation of what Rev. Aaron Lichtenstein called societal beatitude. Laws shape a society, and a society needs space. A sacred society needs sacred space, a holy land. Hence, Jews and Judaism need their own land. In 4,000 years, for much of which Jews lived in exile, the people of the covenant were scattered over the face of the earth. There is no land in which Jews have never lived. Yet in all those centuries, there was only one land where they were able to do what almost every other nation takes for granted, create their own society in accordance with their own beliefs. The premise of the Torah is that God must be found somewhere in particular if he is to be found anywhere in general. There must be some place where the a presence of God is peculiarly visible and transparent. And that is what Israel is. Just as in creation narrative, Sabbath is holy time, so in the Torah as a whole, Israel is holy space, the space where the presence of God is peculiarly lucid. And that is why in Judaism, religion is tied to a land, and a land is linked to a religion. But now we come to the most perplexing part of Rabbi Isaac's comment. Recall what he said. Should anyone call into question the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel, the Jewish people can reply, God created the universe. He divided earth into many lands, languages, and landscapes. But one small land he gave to the Jewish people, that is our title to the land. Now, how on earth could Rabbi Isaac think of this as a compelling answer? I mean, almost inevitably, somebody who challenges the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel will not believe in the God of Israel. So how will a reference to Israel's God make Israel's case? Ironically, today, we know the answer to that question. Today, the overwhelming majority of those who challenge Israel's right to exist believe in Israel's God. That is to say, the God of Abraham. They belong to the large family of faith known as the Abrahamic monotheisms. To them we must humbly say, when it comes to political conflict, let us search for a political solution. Let's work together in pursuit of peace. But when it comes to religion, let us not forget that without Judaism there would be no Christianity and no Islam. And unlike Christianity and Islam, Jews never sought to convert the world and they never created an empire. All they sought was one tiny land, promised to the children of Israel by the creator of the universe, in whom Jews, Christians, and Muslims all believe. Sadly, Rabbi Isaac was right, and Rashi was right to quote him at the beginning of his Torah commentary. The Jewish people would one day be challenged on its rights of the land, and we are living in that day, challenged by people who claim to worship the same God, that same God summons us today to the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of human life, and the imperative of peace. And that same God tells us that in a world of 82 Christian nations and 56 Islamic ones, there is room for one small Jewish state. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.